How is everyone tonight? Oh, I am so moved to be here with all of you tonight to celebrate V's extraordinary new book, Reckoning. And to kick off our 25th anniversary celebration of V-Day, the global activist movement to end violence against all women, cisgender and transgender, gender expansive people, people, girls, and the planet. It has been a true privilege to be part of this unprecedented movement over these years. In it, I have found sisterhood and inspiration for my own work as an activist and artist. As a V-Day board member, I have traveled the world, witnessing the work of revolutionary V-Day activists on the ground in their communities, seeing firsthand what is possible when women turn their pain to power and break through cycles of violence and patriarchy. Dismantle that shit. <laughs> I have witnessed women's dreams becoming a reality at the opening of the City of Joy in the Democratic Republic of Congo. I have seen, I have broken bread with women survivors of Katrina in the Lower Ninth Ward in New Orleans, and have had the profound privilege of listening to the stories of black women from the diaspora in Accra, Ghana. This work with V-Day has also brought me onto and behind many stages over the years in the service of telling women's stories, from those of women in prison to those of young girls finding their way in their families and communities. It was the vagina monologues that sparked V-Day into being in this very city. I know many of you in the audience tonight were there for the very first electric performance. These words brought to life the pain and pleasure of women's stories and became a sort of record of the times as, we women, as women and girls were living through the world. Reckoning tells the story of our storyteller, these lifelong writers and activist journey over more than 40 years, inviting us into her journals and pieces written in the moment and collected over a lifetime of reckoning with the world's injustices. It represents both the core of ideas that became V-Day and One Billion Rising, and the methods through which V-Day, V survived abuse and self-hatred, challenging the myths and narratives that have guided her life and chronicling the career of her singular voice. Tonight, we celebrate 25 years of storytelling and solidarity and my incomparable friend V who birthed this all. Her life's work is an example to all of us about what is possible when one truly serves and shows up for people. She is a gift here in our presence. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Woo. Thank you. Woo. Thank you. 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 Wow. Wow. Thank you so much, Rosario. Um, I, I just can't tell you how much I love you. And I was saying to her earlier in, in the dressing room, like when I met Rosario, she was a child. She, I, no, really, really. And I have watched her grow into one of the most extraordinary, brilliant, devoted activists on this planet. I just can't tell you how much I love you. Thank you, 92nd Street Y, for inviting us here and for continuing to invite me back. Um, to celebrate this anniversary in the book, I feel so blessed to have launched so many things here. I want to take a moment before we begin to really bring in Tyree Nichols, to bring him into our hearts, to bring his mother in, to bring his family in, to bring in all the black and brown people in this room tonight who walk this world, this country, in terror, in daily terror and dread. Can we just put energy out here tonight to surround them in love and safety and comfort?
And I want to bring in the woman from Iran, and I want to bring in the woman from Afghanistan, and the Ukraine, and Congo, and Syria, and all the wars in this world where women are pushed down, raped, and undermined through the racist, capitalist patriarchy that swirls through this planet. I want to take in where we are, this amazing audience, this amazing night where we're celebrating 25 years of movement building and rising for women, trans, and non-binary people. We may not have dismantled patriarchy yet, or ended violence against all women, trans, and non-binary people yet, but we certainly have made a mark. We have shifted the dialogue. You know, when we began 25 years ago, and I want to say we are part of a chain of women who have come before us. Rosa Parks was here long before us. Rosa Parks was fighting violence against women and fighting off the rapes of white men long before we got here. And there were people before me doing Take Back the Night, and I'm part of that stream, I'm part of that history. But we have made a mark, we have shifted the dialogue, we have disrupted the normal, we have brought the issue front and center. No one was talking about violence against women 25 years ago. And when they, we did talk about it, people told us to go away, right? We have busted taboos. We can say vagina. Let's say it just for just to say it. Vagina. We can say it, and we say it all the time now, right? And that means that women know where their vaginas are. They know they can look at them. They know they can give them pleasure. They know they can protect them. And they know they can tell other people what they can and cannot do with them. We have been instrumental in making violence against women a front page issue. We've been changing laws and traditions and deepening and expanding the story, understanding that we cannot end violence against women unless we look at all the intersecting violences, racism and white supremacy, capitalism, climate destruction, imperialism, incarceration. In the 25 years, we have opened safe houses, in Kenya to stop female genital mutilation, which is the 20th year, and we know that the practice has been down to, it's been cut two thirds in the Maasai community. And Agnes, my sister Agnes Pereo, who was reviled when she opened that house because I was there, is now a member of parliament. We have opened City of Joy in the Democratic Republic of Congo, which I tell you is the most holy place I have ever been. And we have seen almost 2,000 women graduate and become leaders in their community where they are truly turning pain to power. We have inspired thousands of high school and college students to become activists, funded incredible artists and frontline grassroots groups, and lifted women inside and outside of prison. We have been in solidarity with communities struggling for liberation in the aftermath of black women being murdered by the police in the United States, and with women grappling with war, femicide, militarism, forced migration, and resource depletion in Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, Palestine, Congo, Haiti, Juarez, Mexico, and indigenous communities from Brazil to South Dakota, and those seeking asylum and safety at our borders. We have most importantly built a global network of gorgeous solidarity in almost every country of the world where activists give their lives to a world where women, trans, and non-binary people are safe, free, and empowered. And this has happened because of you. Because of you. Because of we. So this evening is a celebration of you, of we. Everyone in this audience, or most of you, have played a significant role in building the V-Day movement, spreading the energy, supporting efforts financially, broadcasting our news. We have theater producers here tonight, and I want to honor David Stone, who was the first person who bravely produced the Vagina Mogs after here and brought it into the world, raising $5 million, which literally launched the V-Day movement.
I think, I think Kathy and Jimmy may be here tonight. Kathy, are you here? Well, if she's not, she, she hosted the very first V-Day event at her house. And I know the Betty girls are here tonight, and they were literally here from the very beginning. I want to honor two people here tonight who we should honor more often because they have literally created an alternative media which is telling the real stories and they are literally holding a different vision, a different idea of who and what America is. I want Amy Goodman to stand up. And I want, I want Laura Flanders to stand up. And I want to thank both Amy and Laura for being allies and sisters in this movement and carrying our message far and wide. We have directors, producers, actors who have performed the vagina monologues, Emotional Creature, Swimming Upstream in New Orleans, and many other plays. And we have funders and board members. And I'm going to ask our, our, our board members to stand who are here tonight. Please, please thank Pat Mitchell, Carol Black, and Rosario Dawson. And I want to really shout out to, um, we'll take a moment for Susan Swan. We, we, we just wouldn't have, we just wouldn't have a movement without Susan Swan. We just wouldn't. I mean, she has literally worked this movement 12 hours a day, every day for 25 years. And I just want to say, I bow to her, I thank her for her generosity, for her tenacity, for her fierceness, for her vision and her brilliance. And I'd like all of our team to stand who are here tonight, um, and I'd like all the past team of V-Day to stand. Can you just stand so we can appreciate you? Thank you, thank you, thank you. And Christine Schuller, Describer, and Monique Wilson are not here tonight, and Purva Pandey Coleman is not here tonight, but I just want to honor them and thank them. They and all the people who are with us, Carl Chang and um, Chloe and um, all of our team, keep this engine going. I'm going to take a moment to personally thank Tony Montaneri, who has been by my side. He has taught me that men can care as much as women about what happens to us. And I want to shout out to Aja Monet and Hollis Heath. Are you here? Hollis, please stand up. Hollis directed V-Day's new extraordinary soundscape of the voices of black women that had just had a glorious premiere in Accra, Ghana, and it's going to be what replaces the Vagina Monarchs. Hollis, are you here? Are you standing? Uh, thank you. Thank you and Aja for the amazing work. We have many activists here tonight who performed, produced, directed, made possible the tens and thousands of V-Day benefit performances of the Vagina Monologues. Thousands of risings and artistic risings over the years, raising hell and raising money over $120 million to support local anti-violence groups. I want all of you to stand up and I want all of us to thank them. Please, everybody. Stand up. Come on, you're all being shy. You are the heart of V-Day. You are V25, and tonight is your night. Tonight, um, I'm so thrilled at the publication of Reckoning. I want to thank everyone at Bloomsbury, particularly my amazing editor, Nancy Miller, and all the team there who have just been amazing in, in, in their love of this book. And I'm going to take a moment to really honor an amazing woman, my incredible agent, Charlotte Chidi. I've been with Charlotte since I was 23 years old. That is almost 50 years. And I can't imagine what my life would have been without her as a writer. You are simply the most visionary, devoted, loving, consistent, intrepid champion and friend a writer could ever have. And I know you won't stand up, Charlotte, but I love you.
Tonight, we are looking back and we are looking forward. I'm so thrilled to introduce my dear friends, family, and extraordinary actors and beings who have come to read from the book and bring their voices and their incredible talents to this experience. So first, please welcome a woman who I have traveled the world with over 40 years. Um, I've been in peace camps with her in the middle of the Devada, <laughs> in, in radioactive dust in the middle of the Devada um, um, desert. She has been my work companion for many years as we traveled the world and she documented the stories of women. And she really helped me bring this book together in so many ways and her extraordinary images run through this book. And she's gonna read a piece tonight. Please welcome Paula Allen. I'm very happy that my precious, beautiful son is here tonight. And I want to say that um, we've been on an amazing journey together. I met him when I was 23 and he was 15. I was um, with his father. He was a broken, lost person. His mother had been murdered. He had never been loved. And he taught me how to love. And we taught each other how to love. And we brought each other up. And when anyone tells you that, um, you know, family is one thing and it's a construct, it's not, a, it's not the truth. Family is what you determine it to be and it's who you determine to love. And I just want to say that his presence in my life and the journey we've taken together has been one of the most powerful, meaningful, gorgeous things in my life. He's an amazing actor and he's the funniest person I know. So please welcome Dylan McDermott. And the next person I want to welcome um, is obviously an astonishing actor, an amazing woman. But I have to say, when I, um, I was doing the vagina monologues way downtown at here, and I had this idea that we should, with a group of women, we would start V-Day, a wonderful group of women, Marianne Schnall and Susan and a lot, Karen O'Bell, people are in this room tonight. We decided we would try to use it to end violence against women. We put on this big production at Hammerstein Ballroom and we'd invite all these great, powerful actors to come. And I knew everyone would be terrified to do it because it was terrifying to do it, you know. Um, and I, M Marissa had come to see the show and I, I just called her up and I said, could we have a talk? And we walked and I said, you know, Marissa, it would just be amazing if you'd be willing to perform the vagina model. And she was like, what? And um, I said, I know, it's, it's big, it's big, it's a big ask. Um, but she said yes. And because Marissa said yes, I went to Glenn Close and I said, you know, Marissa Tomei is doing it. Yeah. <laughs> And then I could go to, and then I had two, and then I could go to Susan Sarandon and say, but Glenn Close and Marissa, and that's how it went, you know? And um, she's been with Vide from the very beginning. She's been such an amazing friend to this movement, and I just love her so much. Please welcome Marissa Tomei. And the next person I want to welcome is a new friend who I've been a great, great admirer of. And we were, I, would, I, I would write little notes to her on Instagram hoping she would be my friend <laughs> because I just was so in awe of her amazing talent. Um, I, I, I kind of was stalking her. Um, but, um, um, but you may have seen her in The Undoing or The Watcher, Watcher or Harry Potter. But um, I don't know, there's something about her that is so um, honest and raw and beautiful and brilliant. And I'm so happy she agreed to be with us tonight. And I'm gonna say her name right, I know I am. Please welcome Noma Dumaswene. That's <laughs> 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 <It was> perfect! <laughs> yeah. I mean, can we have a more magnificent group? Oh my God, okay. <laughs> So I'm going to begin by reading an excerpt from the introduction so you'll get a sense of what the book's about. And then people are going to come up and do their thing and we're just going to go. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take a drink of water before we start. This book 
is about slowing down and assessing and looking, really looking. It's about accountability and discomfort. It's about remembering and honoring the most vulnerable and the most vulnerable moments. It's about lost love and craving touch in our aloneness. It's about tearing down walls and wondering why we build them. It's about the time of AIDS and a world of endless femicide. It's about grief, trauma, a raging virus, and writing. It's about reckoning. America has never been big on reckoning. Here we live in the always almost about to arrive future. We're a country that is driven by five essential verbs, produce, extract, consume, erase, win. Reckoning and all the attending particulars like reflection, understanding, accountability, require an expanse of time and attention. They demand stillness, a stretch of emptiness, Living in the United States has always felt like living inside a criminal on the run. We are a people running, running from new house to better house, iPhone to iPhone, state to state, always dissatisfied, always hungry. Running from families, from trauma, from bad feelings, from grief, running from knowledge and responsibility, running from the original crime. The guilt and shame of how this country began, stolen from the indigenous, running from 400 years of slavery and all the intending violence and degradation towards black people. Living in the United States has always been a breathless experience. And that was even before the time of COVID. The time when the lack of breath became collectively catastrophic. COVID itself, a respiratory virus that put thousands on ventilators and took the final breath from millions worldwide. COVID, the time of a white cop's knee on the neck of George Floyd, literally squeezing the breath out of him over those nine diabolical public minutes. COVID, the fires in California, choking the breath of the earth with smoke, millions of birds suffocating, falling from the sky. Before COVID, our world was already speeding up, seized by more nimble technologies that drove us, connected us, tweeted us, canceled us. Our collective body running faster and faster, always the sense that something, someone was nipping at our heels about to catch us and consume us. And perhaps it finally has. Perhaps COVID slowed things down long enough for our ghosts to finally grab us. I know mine were out and about all through that involuntary viral retreat. What exactly does it mean to reckon? And why is it so critical right now? Reckoning demands remembering, acknowledging, and accounting. It requires a certain humility, a willingness to take stock and look deeply and unflinchingly at what is often right in front of us, but we refuse to see. It means determining both one's personal and collective responsibility and how and when they intersect. And it inherently compels the action of admitting mistakes, apologizing for misdeeds, bad actions, changing course, if that's what's needed. Reckoning is an anomaly in this age of radical disinformation. It's the antidote to fake news, spinning lies, right-wing attempts to bury our country's disturbing history. We are in the midst of an almost perverse pushback against teaching anything of our true past that might make our children feel disturbed or guilty. We and our children will ultimately drown in the polluted sea of diabolical amnesia. It's only in our willingness to face the music, walk through the fire, confront the truth head on, that we are born into ourselves, one another, and a livable future. This book has been a reckoning with myths and narratives that guided my life and needed revision. It's been a reckoning with loss and contradiction. It's been a reckoning with grief. I don't know about all of you, but there is so much unfelt, unshared, unprocessed grief. I have needed to write. It was how I found myself, how I knew I might exist outside the confounds of those oppressive and violent forces who had already, at a very young age, determined me to be bad and unworthy. Writing saved me from suicide from madness, or at least it made something out of that madness. Writing was witness, 
It was prosecution, confession, excavation, deliverance. The articulation of words was a kind of bricklaying, building something even momentarily to stand on, making meaning out of the chaos and violence. Someone once said, you have to be madly grandiose to write, to believe others would truly be interested in your thoughts. But it could also be that writing is survival, a way of cornering the mess, refusing to be swept away in another's tyranny, a cry in the dark. We do our best, uttering as close to the bone as possible, venturing further and further into the dark room of truth calling us to be its accomplice, saying what every cell in our body urges us not to say, breaking through the guardrails, the taboos, and the thorny unspoken. I am older now, irrelevant in the culture of youth followers and TikTok, but I write anyway. I write and I write through the last vestiges of night and then suddenly the sun igniting the crystal edge branches of winter trees, diamond starlight flashing against the Cyrillian sky. I am here and not here, disappearing and finally gone. And maybe the deepest reckoning is that the nothingness I have feared forever is not frightening after all. Maybe it's where we come from and the vast welcoming emptiness calling us home. And maybe what I've called existence is just the burning desire to grab hold of the others before I go. I was a funny person once, hmm. New York City, 1989. One day, a very gaunt woman arrived in the Oliveri drop-in center for unhoused women. It was as if she had just surfaced from an underground torture chamber. She had cigarette burns all over her arms and legs. Her hair was literally breaking into pieces. She was covered in dust. She was clearly about to die. I grabbed her and rushed her to the emergency room in a taxi. Even in that near-death state, she was making jokes about how attractive she was. I could tell she was funny. I wrote this for her. It's dark where I am. It's gray and timeless and no one comes. The edges are blurred. The edges are holes filled with thick, sour mud that smells like sulfur sometimes, and period blood, and pee. I have not had a clock by my bed for three years. I have not had a bed. Not a stationary bed I can come back to, a soft, welcoming bed. I'm a big cow meat on a slab. They move me around a lot. They move me from steel tables and cots. Sometimes I'm a slab of cow meat on two hard orange plastic chairs. Sometimes I'm on concrete. Sometimes the flies rest on me and I don't shoo them away. They fuck on me and lay eggs. The eggs burrow into my skin. I feel the bugs and the ugly little things hatching out of me. When I touch my hair, it feels like a wig. It feels like dead people's hair feels like after they've prepared it for the casket. There are hair diseases. When I touched my hair yesterday, a whole patch of it came out in my hand. It didn't seem like mine, but I, I, I could feel a bald space on my scalp. The memories hurt like sharp rocks against my temples. I was a funny person once. I told stories at cocktail parties and people gathered around and their mouths were open and laughing, white teeth, and they were all excited about me. I was entertaining. I was funny. I wore silk clothes. I read complicated books. 
I had clean fingernails. I had a wallet and photographs. I had a telephone and cotton sheets. I've stopped speaking out loud here. The words hurt. They hurt as they're coming out of me. They remind me that I'm dirty. They remind me that I've stopped washing, stopped moving, stopped longing. The words are like other people, separate from me. And they leave me as they come out. I want to keep my words. I want them to stay. They're my only family. You are scared of me. I see you not looking at me, working hard to not be looking at me. You're afraid that my poverty will contaminate you. Poverty's contagious. You hate my despair. You're repulsed by my suffering. I am the reminder that anything can happen. Our brains are changed by tragedy. They sometimes snap. I am the reminder that abuse catches up with you. It can make you forget your name. It can make you lose your way. It can make you pee on yourself. Not move from the warm wetness because it feels safe feel somewhere else. I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make it. Folding Montauk, New York, 1988. They were lined up your things like body bags like stranded organs. I fold the blue and white striped cotton shirt. It is soft, and I remember you were carrying me in your arms, and our baby was dying. And the way the light and the soft white and blue made your tan face look so fragile. I remember you once wore that shirt to the beach because you were sunburned. The way you put on the thick white cream, but never rubbed it in properly so that people would feel sorry for you, as it made you look sick or deranged, hard to tell. <laughs> mm. And I remember you were wearing the white and blue striped shirt with maybe sneakers, and there was this spring air, and I met you for iced cappuccinos, and we smoked too many cigarettes. We were celebrating an opening, I think. I believed you when you said you lived for the sound of my typewriter. Mm. I fold the shirt and my hands are sweating like you used to sweat when you would chew too much gum after quitting drinking and you would get severe stomach cramps bent over in the airport terminal. Everything you did was extreme. M, your chest was a monument. It was home plate. We went on for years. It was an accident. Love. You'd come back to bed after too much coffee in the front page, and we'd hold each other and start over. Your chest, a few perfectly placed straggly gray hairs, your underarms soft. For a time, I dreamed of living there. I'm folding this white and blue striped shirt, and there are boats we have been on, and trains, and airplanes, and motorcycle rides, and dogs, both of them rescued, both of them bit people. <laughs> and our cat, Simon, we discovered was Simone. <laughs> 
10 years later. <laughs> now rubbing the shirt. I remember the way we would spot each other in the distance and move toward each other, caught that smile like we had just met. The way you love pickles and hero sandwiches and liquids and anything, chocolate and strange country music and playing dead and slicing my leather boots when you got angry and ripping the refrigerator door off. Your fist made holes in the walls and we covered them with cheap prints of wild animals. I didn't give you enough. No one giving you enough. The nature of love and origins and holes too wide, making more impossible holes. Meat and potato man. Alligator man. I'm folding your white and blue striped shirt. Wish I could keep this smell. The sounds you made in your throat, always clearing your throat. Something always stuck there. <laughs> You promised we would grow old together. You promised you'd come back to save me, and you did, and we got better. No shakes anymore. No anxiety attack on the grocery line. We lived through Libya, Granada, Carter, Bush, Reagan, Three Mile Island, AIDS, one million in Central Park against nuclear war, hostages, Abby dying. Berlin Wall coming down, Tiananmen Square, Mandela free, acid rain. I am folding this shirt. My, my hands are, are trembling because I'm alone. Alone. When these things go, when the body bags are removed, just the dried blood on the ground and the shadow outline like after a crime. But this wasn't one. It was an accident. A momentous occasion that somehow went on for years and became something called my life. I met you in a bar. You were handsome, sober, and hyper, and it was all sweaty and summer in one room apartments and we made love nine hours and lost afternoons and this was the beginning of my adult life. I had never been with one person before, never said yes, let's find out where this goes. Let's go the whole way and see. And we stopped growing in the same direction. I am going to be alone. When these things go, hold me, don't stop, M. This was the great event. You, am. I won't watch. I won't get to watch you. Your hair turn white and you grumpy and old and cantankerous. Hard to believe I wanted that, but I did. I fold the shirt and I keep trying to swallow my throat closing like the trap door on the witch's castle in the Wizard of Oz. July comes and the people return and it stays light longer and longer. You were as close to it as I come or may ever come. The boats pulling out, the voices of the children painfully loud, screaming now in the late 
summer day. Dear Mother Earth, Kingston, New York, 2019. In 2018, I wrote a book, The Apology. I had waited most of my life for my father to apologize to me for sexually abusing and battering me as a child. Even after he was dead and gone for 31 years, I still waited. So, I decided to write the apology from him that I needed to hear. It was an excruciating and ultimately liberating experience. But after I was finished, I realized that there was an apology I needed to make. It began with the article about the birds the 2.9 billion missing North American birds, the 2.9 billion birds that disappeared and no one noticed. The sparrows, blackbirds and swallows who didn't make it, who weren't ever born, who stopped flying or singing or making their most ingenious nests, who didn't perch or peck their gentle beaks into moist black earth. It began with the birds. Hadn't we even commented in June, Celeste and I, that they were hardly here? A kind of eerie quiet had descended. But later, they came back. The swarms of barn swallows and the huge ravens landing on the gravel one by one. I know, it was after hearing about the birds. That afternoon, I crashed my bike. Suddenly falling, falling, unable to prevent the catastrophe ahead, unable to find the brakes or make them work, unable to stop the falling. I fell and spun and realized I had already been falling. That we have been falling, all of us. And crows and conifers and ice caps and expectations falling and falling and I wanted to keep falling. I didn't want to be here to witness drying. I didn't want to be here to witness everything falling, missing, bleaching, burning, drying, disappearing, choking, never blooming. I didn't want to live without the birds or bees and sparkling flies that light the summer nights. I didn't want to live with hunger that turned us feral or desperation that gave us claws. I wanted to fall and fall into the deepest, darkest ground and be finally still and buried there. But mother, you had other plans. The bike landed in grass and dirt and bang, I was 10 years old, fallen in the road, my knees scraped and bloody. And I realized that even that nature, I realized that even then, nature was something foreign and cruel, something that could and would hurt me because everything I had ever known or loved that was grand and powerful and beautiful had become foreign and cruel and eventually hurt me, forever cast out and eventually hurt me. Even then, I had already been exiled, or so I felt, forever cast out of the forest. I belonged to the broken, the contaminated, the dead. Maybe it was the sharp pain in my knee and elbow or the dirt embedded in my new jacket. Maybe it was the shock or the realization that death was preferable to the thick tar of grief coagulated in my chest. Or maybe it was just the lonely rattling of the spokes of the bicycle wheel still spinning without me. Whatever it was, 
it broke. It broke. And I heard the howling. Mother, I am the reason the birds are missing. I am the cause of salmon who cannot spawn and the butterflies unable to take their journey home. I am the coral reef bleached death white and the sea boiling with methane. I am the millions running from lands that have been dried, forests that are burning, or islands drowned in water. I didn't see you, mother. You were nothing to me. My trauma, smelted arrogance and ambition drove me to that crackling, pulsing city, chasing a dream, chasing the prize, the achievement that would finally prove I wasn't bad or stupid or nothing or wrong. Oh, my mother, what contempt I had for you. What did you have to offer that would give me status in the marketplace of ideas and achieving? What could your bare trees offer but the staggering aloneness of winters or greenness I could not receive or bear? I reduced you to weather and inconvenience, something that got in my way, dirty slush that ruined my overpriced city boots with salt. I refused your invitation scorned your generosity, held suspicion of your love. I ignored all the ways we used and abused you. I pretended to believe the stories of the fathers who said you had to be tamed and controlled, that you were out to get us. I press my bruised body down on your grassy belly, breathing me in and out. I have missed you, mother. I have been away so long. I am sorry. I am so sorry. I am made of dirt and grit and stars and river, skin, bone, leaf, whiskers, and claws. I am a part of you, of this, this nothing more or less. I am mycelium, petal pistol and stamen. I am branch and hive and trunk and stone. I am what has been here and what is coming. I am energy and I am dust. I am wave and I am wonder. I am impulse and an order. I am perfume, peonies, and the single parasol tree in the African savannah. I am lavender, dandelion, daisy, dahlia, cosmos, chrysanthemum, pansy, bleeding heart, and rose. I am all that has been named and unnamed. All that has been gathered and all that has been left alone. I am your missing creatures. All the sweet birds that were never born. I am daughter. I am caretaker. I am fierce defender. I am griever. I am bandit. I am baby. I am supplicant. I am here now. Mother, I am yours. Mm -hmm. I am yours. Mm -hmm. I am yours. Rock, rock it. Woo! Whoa. Woo! Sometimes Ooh. <laughs> it's so can't stop. Mm. 
take off shirt, undo belt. Clumsy, you do it. No, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. Undo bra. One more. Strip down. Sometimes it's all about skin, just skin, just the way. Skin. Oh, God. Sometimes it's like mouth on mouth. Teeth, tongue, have to. Sometimes you thought you were friends. <laughs> and this current turns into one week in a small hotel room in East Berlin. <laughs> Sometimes it's about watching or being watched, undressing in front of them, in front of the big window. Sometimes it's you putting a hand on yourself and them watching. Sometimes it's a crowded boat filled with cheering tourists on the Adriatic and you're both caught there naked humping in the sand and you don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it's, it's scuff marks on the off yellow carpet in the posh South Kensington apartment. Sometimes it's a dare, 45 floors up, mouth on them in a building that once existed and they come by the time. Sometimes it's driving on the mad Italian speedway at a thousand miles, your face buried in his jeans. Sometimes it's melting hot. Summer day and you're passed out in the afternoon and you wake up ooh, with his rugged face between your legs. Oh, sometimes it's the 29 year old lean boy from the village with the curly black hair who comes to your summer house on the edge of the sea and kisses you. And you know it's August and you're suddenly not 54. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes it's a song or a joint or too much chocolate. Sometimes it's only chocolate. Or birthday cake at midnight because one of you is married. Sometimes he just says in a proper English accent, do you mind if I put my penis inside you? <laughs> and it occurs to you, you don't. <laughs> Sometimes it's that window wide open in Montauk and it's so bright, you're only wearing sunglasses, looking out, as the wild Aussie takes you from behind, sweating and screaming out. And sometimes it just happens in Portugal. <laughs> For the first time in seven years, you find each other. <laughs> oh, and you're not afraid. And sometimes it's the hysteria that comes after they have been that deep inside you and the crying is a way of coming. And sometimes it's riding them like a Bronco. <laughs> or humping her like you're about to get there. And sometimes it's the three of you in a hot tub and you end up entangled, not knowing whose hair, whose mouth, whose hand, whose breast. And sometimes you dress up. And they take it off you. Sometimes it's hardness. It's softness. It's grabbing. It's refusing. Embarrassing. Sometimes it's, you're beautiful, or God, you're ass. Your skin. <laughs> Sometimes it's so insanely funny, it's ridiculous. But mainly, it <laughs> takes longer. It's all preparation. You lose track of who begins. Who's on top. Who got more. Who's inside who. <laughs> yeah, baby. <laughs> Hi. I loved big men. <laughs> big, full sized Irishmen. Men with big hands, strong backs, a little belly. Men who worked the docks or drove school buses, firemen, men who lifted heavy things all day, men who in their own small way kept the world moving forward, men who were lonely and said so after a couple of drinks, <laughs> men who needed to push you against the wall in the dark and, or flatten you against the worn linoleum floor and have you and hurt you a little because the hunger for having became too much and they raged at themselves for being so needy. Men who were mute, unable to articulate their own confusion or vulnerability, who unlike women of the same order had no capacity for 
pain or aloneness. These men spoke to me. Their whiskey breath, sometimes cursing me in the dark. Their rough hands gently stroking my hair as they thrust their fear, their ignorance and doubt into me. And I let myself receive their sorrow. And frankly, I was wild with the receiving, wild with their manly frenzy. I craved their working hands and mouths, their muscular hips and thighs. I craved, I craved every part of them. I craved their erect, lonely pricks. I craved them tearing into me, ripping into the center of my torso, charging into my heart. These men, these big, mute, working men, opening to me in the dark. My mother gave me wonder, but not comfort. So I confused mystery with anonymity, performance with connection, and awe with love. Mm. <laughs> that was rocket. <laughs> that was my beloved fairy Celeste Lacine, who I wrote that play called Extraordinary Measures about our dear Paul Walker. May he come into this room who died of AIDS. He was an extraordinary actor and visionary and director and music and, and, and acting teacher. And Celeste performed that play after his death called Extraordinary. Thank you so much, Celeste. Thank you so much. Where all the grief? Kingston, New York, 2018. I used to wonder where all the grief of all the people went. I would stare at strangers in the parks and restaurants, inspecting their faces for cracks of sorrow. The grief was everywhere, but nowhere you could touch. I felt it in my room at night, not ghostly exactly, but thick <clears throat> and pressing in. On my haunches, I rocked myself to sleep to shake off the suffocating apparition. I felt it in the clinking ice cubes of my parents' cocktail hour. I felt it in the sluggish walk of those who worked for the rich. I felt it in the way my perfect, beautiful mother could not be found. I felt it in the manic boys grabbing at my teenage tits I, w I was terrified. The grief was waiting somewhere. Terrified it was gathering. Terrified it would return one day and swallow us whole. And maybe it has, or it is. What is the military but the slaughtered, but the saluted straitjacket of our mourning? What are drones, assault rifles, and bombs but steely weapons aimed at our sadness, or anyone or anything that resembles it? What is pornography but a gaudy performance of our deepest loss and longing? Today, I stood in front of the muddy river in my backyard after days of rain. I thought of every river I've ever met, every ocean, and every lake. I thought of the salty aqua Adriatic that has healed bitterness and bites in July. I thought of Juju Beach in Chennai and the procession of women of every age in their glittering pink 
purple golden saris at sunset, and then the, the ambling cows. I, I never saw a cow on a beach before. I thought of the rough nakedness of the Atlantic at the tip of Montauk in late September and dunking my bald head, the salt water stinging and cleansing the nicks where I shaved the hairs falling from the chemo. I thought of the Red Sea in Sharma El Sheikh and how all of us sought refuge there right after the bombing and how, how my sister from Somalia told me then, always, when the militias come, run to the sea. I thought of the first time I crossed Lake Kivu from Goma to Buvaku in the Congo and the soft blue waxen horizon seemed, it seemed at odds with so many machete bodies below. And my tears were muddy, humid tears. <laughs> that linked me to a muddy river in the village in Kosovo where the children were playing among the garbage and the human skulls. And that linked me to cartoon communities of kooky penguins on the sandbanks of Cape Town. And that linked me to belly dancers moving with the rhythm of subtle waves on the narrow boat on the Nile, linked me to the wild, low tide in Matabukai, Philippines. We, we waded out in, in high reeds, so stoned, at eight in the morning. And that was the first time I literally got lost in the horizon. My muddy tears, they linked me to the Sen, which is sometimes brown, sometimes green, or black, depending on the light. The Sen, the Sen, which has coursed through my life the way it courses through Paris. The Sen, which has given me two books and my body after cancer. And just two weeks ago, rising unnaturally high, flooding the city, linking me to the Flint River in Michigan. 25,000 kids exposed to lead poisoning, some with scabies and rashes, some stopped growing, some got aggressive. And, and the children dying in the Niger Delta before they reached the hospitals from the oil-contaminated water. Life expectancy now dropped from 70 to 45. Oil! Oil, 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 tears of oil! The carelessness of BP spilling oil and exploding oil in the Gulf of Mexico. Oil drenching pelicans and fish and how that contamination led to the loss of jobs, which didn't allow for grieving, but desperation, which led to women being beaten and humiliated by their unemployed husbands. I sat down by the river and I wept for the lead in the water and sodium fluoride, mercury, arsenic, dioxins, polychlorinated biphenyl, chlorine, percolate, and oil. And I wept for every ocean I have ever met and haven't met. I wept for the dolphins trapped in huge plastic wrappers and albatrosses on Midway Atoll filled with bottle caps and batteries mistaken for food. I wept for the children who would never know what it means to run arms wide open into a voluptuous sea 
without worry, who, who see water as predator, not a source. I wept for our selfishness and stupidity. I wept for all those who will not weep and cannot weep and refuse to let their weeping join them to the sea of weeping, the muddy river of grieving. I wept for the 16-year-old girl who trusted the sea more than her own mother. She would lay her naked, lean body half in, half out of the water, long brown hair, becoming sand, broken shells, stone. And, and she would strongly whisper, almost chant, make me clam, coral, weed, make me jellyfish, trumpet conch, crab, make me salty blue, make me transparent, make me wild. Mm. Woo. Woo. Yeah. To all those who would rob us of our bodily choice, May 6, 2022, I ask you, what is it about our bodies that make you so afraid, so insecure, so cruel and punishing? Is it their singular autonomy or mere existence? Is it their capacity for immense and unending pleasure? Orgasms that can multiply orgasms inside orgasms? <clears throat> Is it our skin? Is it our desire? Is it our openness that rattles you and reminds you of where you are closed? Is it the pure strength of our bodies that allows us to bleed and birth and bend and carry and continue on in spite of all the ways you have reduced us and objectified us, humiliated us and disrespected us and tried to shape us into baby-making machines? Our strength that is inherent and doesn't need to prove itself or show off or rely on weapons or violence to control and terrorize doesn't need to abolish laws or lie to become Supreme Court justices, judges, or president, or rig the decks when they get there. Do you know this power? Mm -hmm. Can you imagine it? A power that comes from respecting life, caring for others before oneself, holding communities together. Do you think we are naive enough to believe that you are motivated by your care for life when you have shown so little respect for it in us? Instead, you spend your days unraveling and resisting all that makes life possible for those mothers and people with babies you claim to protect, fighting against free universal health care, parental paid leave, child allowance. Where's your outrage that this country has the highest maternal mortality rates in the developed world? Ooh. Do you think we have forgotten that some of those who are making the most crucial decisions about millions of our bodies, Kavanaugh and Thomas, <laughs> and the one, <clears throat> Drumpf, <laughs> who chose three of the people on the court currently making these decisions, are men who have been accused of raping other women's bodies, harassing women's bodies, humiliating and bra proudly bragging about grabbing the genitals of women's bodies? Why would we ever trust them to come near our bodies? let alone determine the future of them. <clears throat> what is it about our bodies that makes you think you have the right to invade them? 
determine them, control and legislate them, violate and force them to do anything against their will. Perhaps you mistake our generosity for weakness, our patience for passivity, our vulnerability for fragility. This might be why you are unable to see that there is no chance in fucking hell that we are ever going back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a law yet. And we will never accept this ruling. Mm. Perhaps because you have never known what it is like to have your body controlled by the vindictive anonymous state. To be raped and forced to keep your baby at 12 years old. To be so desperate that you destroy your uterus with a hanger or bleed to death in a back alley. You do not understand that once you have tasted the sweetness of freedom, of choice, once you have come to know your body as your own, once you have freed yourself and felt the expanse of your body, the aliveness in every pore that rises from autonomy, there is no way you will ever give that up, mm -hmm. ever. And because you do not know this, you do not know how dangerous we are, <laughs> how organized <laughs> we are, <laughs> how willing we are to go to any lengths to preserve our freedom. <clears throat> it's been 50 years. Mm -hmm. We have summoned our due. We actually have bank accounts now. <laughs> we have credit cards and we can buy a house. We can serve on juries. <clears throat> we hold offices and our lawyers. We write for newspapers and we run them. We host TV shows and direct movies. We run hospitals and universities and nonprofits and write plays about vaginas. <laughs> <laughs> and books about fascists and fascism. We can't be tossed aside. This is our world now. And these are our bodies. We know what you're up to. This is just the beginning of your diabolical plan to rob us of contraception and marriage equality and civil rights and voting rights and on and on and on. This is all part of your desperation to prevent the future that is on the verge of being born. A future where we know our past and begin to reckon with it. A future where we teach critical race theory yeah. and the truth about white supremacy and sexism and transphobia. A future where we care for our earth and devote our lives to protecting air and water and forests and animals and all living things. A future where people have autonomy over their bodies and wombs and gender and marry who they want to and don't marry if they don't want to and have babies if they want to and don't have babies if they don't want to. And despite all your lies, strategies and devious ways, you are simply never going to stop us. <laughs> you. you have unleashed our fury our solidarity, our unity. We know that our future and everything we have for is at stake. I am willing to lay my body down for this freedom, <clears throat> for every freedom. And I know there are multitude, multitudes who will do the same. <laughs> yeah. For much of my life, I felt like the creature in the David Lynch film, Eraserhead. <laughs> Translucent and overexposed, quivering on a bedroom dresser. I needed a soft white cloth to swaddle me, or a mother who wanted me to feel held and safe. Skin, something to contain and cover me. I remember I was about 10 in the car with my mother. 
we were in a suburban parking lot, and for some reason, <laughs> she felt compelled to tell me about nymphomaniacs. <laughs> She said they were women who couldn't get enough. <laughs> enough of what? <laughs> I asked. But honestly, I already knew. <laughs> Here's how we like it. <laughs> Paris, 1994. Do not come at us. Visit. <laughs> Nestle up. Ask with gentle fingers. Wait for an answer. See if we open. Pretend there's all the time in the world. <laughs> Pretend we're on a faded white bench by the sea. Pretend you're not after anything. You like sitting. <laughs> <laughs> you like smelling. Yes. You like waiting. Uh, <laughs> offer us something soft, something sweet. White chocolate. <laughs> A taste of strawberry jam. Don't come at us. Don't do that paw thing. <laughs> Don't have to have it. Don't erase us in getting to the thing. Don't make us a thing. Be awkward. We love awkward. <laughs> <laughs> Don't have mastered the situation. <laughs> We're not problems. We do not want to be mastered. Don't know what you're doing. Be lost. Fumble. Make a mess. Ask questions. Don't break us. Because then we will become numb, and you will never satisfy us, and you will feel incompetent, and you will get agitated, and you will have to really have it in spite of protests or terror. You will break and enter, and we will get even further apart. Stop worrying about arriving. We're not shopping malls. <laughs> We're openings, causes, mysteries. We're asking you to keep going. And one last thing. Don't fall asleep. <laughs> Don't fall asleep right when it's over. Not for a little while, anyway. A lot begins for us right when you think it's over. <laughs> Talking or crying is still it. <laughs> it's just coming out of another part of our bodies. Hold us, okay? Hold us 
when you think it's over. I need to say, she has never done that before. Oh my God. Wow. Okay. Wow. 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 Okay. Yes, Paul Alice. I love these people so much, I don't even know if I'm coming or coming. I really. Um, I'm going to close with a piece. Um, it's a dream vision of my new name. I've taken V as my name. The name I was originally given was connected to the one who attempted to destroy and undo me. V is my freedom name. I come from the V. I didn't always know this. One of the things the extractors took from me, from us, was memory. They buried it and terrorized it out of us. First, they made us mock our mothers. Then they made us forget them and our language and our names. They made us forget our very particular ways. Their violence separated us from our bodies because our bodies housed our energy, our knowing, our intuition, our sexuality. We became separated from all that made us who we were. V is the name of my real people and reminder of my true origins. It was only by releasing the one who had violated me that I was able to begin to remember. He was the sign, the role of my father. For almost 60 years, even long after he died, he occupied me with terror and made me ignorant and dumb. Now, since the exorcism, much of my memory is returning. Now, through the working of plant medicines and the whisperings of trees, my original ancestors begin to speak to me. The V were a vast and humble people. V for vessel, opening, invitation, the upward reaching side of a diamond inviting the downward side of completion. My people prayed with their arms outstretched in a V. The divine met the V and in that diamond completion there was a luminous fusion. Messages, wisdom were transmitted through the V connector into the people. In the V community there was no such thing as hierarchy. No one above and no one below. Can you imagine it? Each person had a particular gift and offering to the community, and sometimes those gifts evolved and changed. All gifts were valued equally. Each child was encouraged to follow their bliss because that would evolve their particular gift. Some children could speak to the birds and communicate with the trees. Some were precocious and drew images of things they could not have seen in their short years. Some saw the future. They had the gift of prophecy. There were so many disturbing things about this place. I loved so many people as a child. Well, to be honest, I loved everyone. I was constantly reprimanded for this, told it was not possible to love this many people, told I must be insincere or fake. I was instructed to be discerning and selective in my loving. I was punished early on for being too emotional, too available, too sexual. The V were brought up to believe that the expansion of our ability to feel and our life force was the point of our existence. We lived in constant touch, constant pleasure. There was no such thing as work, as everything we did was endowed with enjoyment. That we were taught early that the developing the capacity to see the beauty of their planet was the first critical step of expanding consciousness. And then they were trained to follow that by learning to imitate and manifest that beauty in everything they made or did. How they dressed, how they decorated their homes. Our whole planet was essentially an altar. Bodies were altars. Each one of their homes was an altar too. The V learned early 
that nature was kin and if they slowed everything down, if they devoted themselves to the practice of presence, which involved attention, detailed attention to everything around them, trees and moss and lichen and mycelium and dew and ducks, they could begin to feel what was inside them. Sexuality was divine. Masturbation was the highest form of prayer. I need some clicks on that. <laughs> Many of them were practiced at it. To know your own sexual rhythms and intensities, to ride them and learn to direct and open them without harming or invading was the highest art and good. When the extractors came, they were disturbed by the V's openness and intensity. Something terrible had clearly already happened to the extractors and they were ragged and closed and mean. The unapologetic ecstasy of the V enraged them and made them feel jealous and inferior. They read their invitation as a way of mocking them rather than a way of joining them. This set them on a terrible course against the V. They began a ruthless campaign to diminish and reduce them. They raped and maimed and murdered their sacred bodies. The V had never known these kind of horrors, so they were particularly vulnerable. The extractors bought a thing called shame. It was a poison. They brought shame to the V's genitals. They separated them out from the rest of their bodies. The extractors separated the V into genders, into races, binaries, that would eventually come to war with each other. Each division was shocking and catastrophic because they had been a people who found their meaning in the joining. They had no protection against this demonic dividing. One division created other divisions, cancers mutating into other cancers. Once that process had begun, there was no way to stop it. Here, in this particular time of trauma, where the individual is worshipped and held before all else, we see the great hardship it has caused. In the time of the V, they did not have such things as factories, huge farms, banks, prisons, money, police, nation states, soldiers, credit cards, bureaucracy, warehouses, anything that numbed people or treated them or made them feel less than human or took them out of their bodies or hurt their bodies. They did not know marriage or any kinds of coupling that involved ownership or separation from the rest of the community. They did not know punishment, abandonment, exclusion, deprivation, war, cruelty, poverty, grades, reviews, disability, elites, racism that would have implied they were not one race. Their pleasure was based on the stunning beauty of diversity among and within them. Jealousy was a rare occurrence because everyone felt seen and held by everyone. Each one of them knew for certain that they were one of her creations. How could they not love each other and themselves? How could they not ever determine that one of them was better or more right than another or not worthy of love? That would have been the greatest insult to their creator. Each person arrived with physical, emotional, and psychological particularities that were teaching for both the person and the whole community. If a person was depressed, for example, they were considered a gift, developing the layers of patience and needed care. If someone was born blind, they deepened and refined the community's sense of touch, smell, sound, and sensuality. The joy of existence was learning how to serve each person's emotional and physical particularities. I never wrote about the V before. I've been afraid to share what I remember. I know how cynical and judgmental this world can be and snarky. I've been hurt over and over by the cold suspicion of the untreated ones who are bleeding and brutal. Their scoffing nearly crushed me as a child, and when I was 55, the accumulated pain of cruelty became too much. Instead of making life, my womb swelled a lump of death. It grew and grew and broke through the mother wall and quickly began to seize other parts of my body. Through the combined powers of Western medicine and my amazing Dr. Deb Rhodes, who is healed tonight, and the healing properties of holy love, through the shamanic practices of burning away injuries, lies, traumatic wounds, distortions, and bad choices, I was birthed back to the trees, the dirt, the stars, the sun, and most dramatically, back into my own body. That's, that's, that's where the memories were stored and some were released upon entry. But still something kept me from opening the rest. It was only when I became strong enough to climb into the soul of my father predator, 
Only when I was able to understand who he was and why. Only when I allowed myself to be gripped mercilessly by his unfelt agony. Only when I was able to detail his crimes toward me. And only after I wrote his in-depth apology that I was finally able to release that extractor's grip on me. Change your name, a voice said shortly after. Take the name of your first family, V. You will, of course, have your doubts and derisions by what authority, what proof, how can she be sure that V ever existed. The whole world is a story of somebody's making. Those with the power get to determine the characters, the angles, and the shape. I believe in the power of a name, a testament or honoring, a recalling or a conjuring. What might seem like a memory can as surely be a prophecy. Oh. It's up to us, my friends. It's up to us. Mm. Thank you. Now, please welcome Taina. In a time of an upheaval Will come a transformation Ignite a fire that will burn Like the sun Become a strong movement Fierce and determined Informed by where we are And where we come We are those who are rising Woo! Woo! From Manila to Miami Building trust and solidarity Love is our bond And in the streets we are marching To end the rape and the suffering To stop the fascist tyranny Organize as one We are, we are Rising We are, we are Rising We are, we are Rising now And in this life From the who dare to interrupt the violence to those who expose the truth and seek the silence warriors who work to open up the prison bars valiant souls who stand up against the unjust wars multitudes who defy wars along the border masses who unify to protect our water rebel minds who unionize for workers rights Feel it's hard to fight to defend trans lives Those who take back their land and their health Those who seek to redistribute the wealth Youth who demand a right to education Those who reclaim political power in their nation We cry out, say her name We chant, love Trump's hate And we will not be erased. It's we who decide our fate. Cause we are, we are rising. We are, we are rising. We are, we are rising now. And in this In this life, 
We are women who've adored violence and degradation Slavery, trafficking and mutilation Rape and abuse, racist discrimination Those who survive labor exploitation Colonization and gentrification Prison and migration and militarization Homophobia and transphobic aggression Violence and police reproductive oppression But from the pain we will open eyes Awaken hearts and awaken minds And as a man we intensify Strategically we are organized Together we can raise the vibration Through our action and imagination Respect, trust and communication And love for our future generation Intersectional inclusive we come Collect the power is how this is won We keep it rising like the power of the sun We will rise like the sun, we will rise like the sun One for a billion We are, we are rising We are, we are rising We are, we are rising now And in this life We are, we are rising We are, we are rising We are, we are rising now